the lion shows up and everyone starts running, you run with them. That does not work well in markets. In fact, you generally have to do the opposite. In your lecture on the basics of finance and investing, you mentioned a book, Intelligent Investor by Benjamin Graham, as being formative in your life. What key lesson do you take away from that book that informs your own investing? Sure. Actually, it was the first investment book I read. And as such, it was kind of the inspiration for my career and a lot of my life. Important book. Bear in mind, this is sort of after the Great Depression. People lost confidence in investing in markets. World War II. And then he writes this book. It's for like the average man. And basically he says that you have to understand the difference between price and value. Price is what you pay. Value is what you get. The stock market is here to serve you. And it's a bit like the neighbor that comes by every day and makes you an offer for your house. Makes you a stupid offer, you ignore it. Makes you a great offer, you can take it. And that's the stock market. And the key is to figure out what something's worth. And you have to kind of weigh it. The stock market in the short term is a voting machine. It represents speculative interests, you know, supply and demand of people in the short term. But in the long term, the stock market's a weighing machine. You're much more accurate. It's going to tell you what something's worth. And so if you can divine what something's worth, then you can really take advantage of the market because it's really here to, to help you. And that's kind of the message of the book. In that same way, there's a kind of difference between speculation and investing. Yeah. Speculation is just a bit like buying, trading crypto, short-term trading crypto. Maybe in the long run, there's intrinsic value. But many investors in a bubble going into the crash were really just pure speculators. They didn't know what things were worth. They just knew they were going up, right? That's speculation. And investing is, you know, doing your homework, digging down, understanding a business, understanding the competitive dynamics of an industry, understanding what management's going to do, understanding what price you're going to pay. You know, the value of anything, I would say, other than love, let's say, is the present value of the cash you can take out of it over its life. Now, some people think about love that way, but it's not, it's not the right way to think about love. Investing is about basically building a model of what this business is going to produce over its lifetime. How do you get to the value of a thing on the stock market? Sure. Companies. The value of a security is the present value of the cash you can take out of it over its life. So if you think about a bond, you know, bond pays a 5% coupon interest rate. You get that, you know, let's say, every year or twice a year, split in half. And it's very predictable. And if it's a US government bond, you know you're gonna get it. So that's a pretty easy thing to value. A stock is an interest in a business. It's like owning a piece of a company. And a business, a profitable one, is like a bond in that it generates these coupons or these earnings or cash flow you know, every year. The difference with a stock and a bond is that the bond, it's a contract. You know what you're gonna get as long as they don't go bankrupt and default. With a stock, you have to make predictions about the business. You know, how many widgets are going to sell this year? How many are going to sell next year? What are the costs going to be? How much of the money that they generate do they need to reinvest in the business to keep the business going? And that's more complicated. But what we do is we try to find businesses where with a very high degree of confidence, we know what those cash flows are going to be for a very long time. And there are very few businesses that you can have a really high degree of certainty about. And as a result, you know, many investments are speculations because it's really very difficult to predict. What I do for a living is find those rare companies that you can kind of predict what they're going to look like over a very long period of time. What are the factors that indicate that a company is going to be something that's going to make a lot of money, it's going to have a lot of value, and it's going to be reliable over a long period of time? Every consumer has a view on different brands and uh, different companies. You know, what we look for are sort of these non-disruptable businesses, a business where you can kind of close your eyes, stock market shuts for a decade, and you know that 10 years from now, it's going to be a more valuable, more profitable company. So we own a business called Universal Music Group. It's in the business of helping artists become global artists, that's sort of the recorded music business, and it's in the business of owning music publishing rights of songwriters. I think music is forever, right? Music is a many thousand year old part of the human experience, and I think it will be, you know, thousands of years from now. And so that's a pretty good backdrop to invest in a company. And the company basically owns a third of the global recorded music, the most dominant sort of market share in the business. They're the best at taking an artist who's 18 years old, who's got a great voice and helping that artist become a superstar. And that's a unique talent. And the result is the best artists in the world want to come work for them. But they also have this incredible library of, you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stone, the U2, etc. And then if you think about what music has become, it used to be about records and CDs and eight track tapes. And it was about a new format and that's how they drive sales. And it's become a business about streaming. And streaming is a lot more predictable than selling records, right? You can sort of say, okay, how many people have smartphones? How many people are going to have smartphones next year? There's a kind of global penetration over time of smartphones. And you pay, call it 10, 11 bucks a month for a subscription or last for a family plan. And you can kind of build a model of what the world looks like and predict the growth of the streaming business, predict what kind of market share Universal is going to have over time.
You can't get to a precise view of value. You can get to an approximation. And the key is to buy at a price that represents a big discount to that approximation. And that gets back to Ben Graham. Ben Graham was about what he called, he invented this concept of margin of safety, right? You want to buy a company at a price that if you're wrong about what you think it's worth, and it turns out to be worth 30% less, you paid a deep enough discount to your estimate that you're still okay. Investing, a big part of investing is not losing money. If you can avoid losing money and then have a few great hits, you can do very, very well over time. There are all kinds of risks in every business. This is one that I think has a very high degree of persistence, and I can't envision a world where beyond streaming, in a sense. Now, you may have a Neuralink chip in your head instead of a phone, but the music can come in a digitized kind of format. You're going to want to have an infinite library that you can walk around in your pocket or in your brain. It's not going to matter that much if the form factor, you know, the device changes. It's not really that important, whether it's Spotify or Apple or Amazon that are providers. I think the value is really going to reside in the content owners, and that's really the artists and the label. But that's sort of one example. Another example could be just, you know, the restaurant industry. You look at businesses like a McDonald's, right? It's whatever the company's like a 1950 vintage business. And here we are, it's, you know, 75 years later. And uh, you can kind of predict what it's going to look like over time. And the menu is going to you know, adjust over time to consumer tastes. And but I think the hamburger and fries is probably forever. The Beatles, the Rolling Stones, the hamburger and fries are forever. What's the actual process you go through? The process of figuring out what the value of a company is. Like, how do you do the research? So Chipotle, what attracted us initially, the stock price dropped by about 50%. Great company, great concept. Athletes love it, consumers love it. Healthy, sustainable, fresh food made in front of your eyes. But ultimately, the company's lacking some of the systems and had a food safety issue. Consumers got sick, almost killed the rent. But the reality of the fast food quick service industry is almost every fast food company has had a food safety issue over time. And the vast majority have survived. And we said, look, such a great concept, but their approach was far from ideal. We start with usually reading the SEC filings. Companies file a 10K or an annual report, and they file these quarterly reports called 10Qs. They have a proxy statement which describes kind of the governance, the board structure. Conference call transcripts are publicly available. It's kind of very helpful to go back five years and kind of learn the story. You know, here's how management describes their business. Here's what they say they're going to do. Then you can follow along to see what they do. Uh, it's like a historical record of how competent and truthful they are. You know, it's a very useful device. And then, of course, looking at competitors and thinking about what could dislodge this company? If it's an industry we don't know well, we know the restaurant industry really well. Music industry, you know, we'll talk to people in the industry. We'll try to understand the difference between publishing and recorded music. We'll look at the competitors. We'll read books. You know, I read a book about the music industry or a couple books about the industry. It's a bit like a big research project and these so-called expert networks now. And you can get pretty much anyone on the phone and they'll talk to you about an aspect of the industry that you don't understand and want to learn more about. Try to get a sense. You know, public filings of companies generally give you a lot of information, but not everything you want to know. And you can learn more by talking to experts about some of the industry dynamics, the personalities. You want to get a sense of management. I like watching podcasts. If a CEO were to do a podcast or a YouTube interview, you get a sense of the people. The kind of business we're looking for is the kind of business everyone should be looking for, right? A great business. It's got a long-term trajectory of growth, even beyond the foreseeable distance, right? Those are the kind of businesses you want to own. You want businesses that generate a lot of cash. You want businesses you can easily understand. You want businesses with these sort of huge barriers to entry where it's difficult for others to compete. You want companies that don't have to constantly raise capital. And these are some of the great businesses of the world, but people have figured out that those are the great businesses. So the problem is those companies tend to have very high stock prices and the value is generally built into the price you have to pay for the business. So we can't earn the kind of returns we want to earn for investors by paying a really high price. Price matters a lot. You can buy the best business in the world, and if you overpay, you're not going to earn particularly attractive returns. We get involved in cases where a great business has kind of made a big mistake, or you have a company that's kind of lost its way, but it's recoverable. We buy from shareholders who are disappointed, who've lost confidence, selling at a low price relative to what it's worth if fixed, and then we try to be helpful in fixing the company. You said barriers to entry. How do you know if there's a type of moat protecting from competitors stepping up to the plate? The most difficult analysis to do as an investor is that. It's kind of figuring out how wide is the moat? How much at risk is the business to disruption? And we're in, I would say, the greatest period of disruptability in history, right? Technology, a couple of 19-year-olds can you know, leave whatever university, or maybe they didn't even go in the first place. They can raise millions of dollars. They can get access to infinite uh, bandwidth storage they can contract with engineers in low-cost uh, markets around the world. They can build a virtual company, and they can disrupt businesses that seem super established over time. And then on top of that, you have major companies with multi-trillion dollar market caps working to find profits wherever they can. 
And so that's a dangerous world in a way to be an investor. You have to find businesses that it's hard to foresee a world in which they get disrupted. And the beauty of the restaurant business, and we've actually, our best track record is in restaurants. We've never lost money. We've only made a fortune, interestingly, investing in restaurants. A big part of it's a really simple business. And if you get Chipotle right and you're at 100 stores, you know, it's not so hard to envision getting to 200 stores and then getting to 500 stores. And the key is maintaining the brand image, growing intelligently, having the right systems. Now, when you go from 100 stores to 3,500 stores, you have to know what you're doing. There's a lot of complexity. You know, if you think about your local restaurant, you know, the family's working in the business, they're watching the cash register, and you can probably open another restaurant across town. But there are very few restaurant operators that own more than a few restaurants and operate them successfully. And the quick service business is about systems that a stranger who doesn't know the restaurant industry can come in and enter the business and build a successful franchise. Now, Chipotle is not a franchise company. They actually own all their own stores, but many of the most successful restaurant companies are franchise models, like a Burger King, a McDonald's, Tim Hortons, you know, all these various brands, Popeyes, and there it's about systems. But the same systems apply whether you own all the stores and it's run by a big corporation or whether the owners of the restaurants are sort of franchisees, you know, local entrepreneurs. So if the restaurant has scaled to a certain number, that means they've figured out some kind of system that works. Yes. It's very difficult to develop that kind of system. So that's a moat. A moat is you get to a certain scale and you do it successfully and the brand is now understood by the consumer. And what's interesting about Chipotle is what they've achieved is difficult. They're not buying frozen hamburgers getting shipped in. They're buying fresh, sustainably sourced ingredients. They're preparing food in the store. That was a first. Quality of the product at Chipotle is incredible. It's the highest quality food you can get. You can get a serious dinner for under 20 bucks and eat really healthfully and very high quality ingredients. And that's just not available anywhere else. And it's very hard to replicate and to build those relationships with farmers around the country. It's a lot easier to make a deal with one of the massive food producers and buy your pork from them than to buy from a whole bunch of farmers around the country. That is a big moat for Chipotle. Very difficult to replicate. You were talking about moats and this kind of remind me of um, Alphabet, parent company. Sure. It's a big position for us. It's interesting that you think that maybe Alphabet fits some of these characteristics. It's tricky to know with everything that's happening in AI. It's interesting that you think that there's a moat. What's your analysis of Alphabet? Why are you still positive about it? It's a business we've admired as a firm for whatever, 15 years, but rarely got to a price that we felt we could own it because again, the expectations were so high and price really matters. And really the sort of AI scare, I would call it. You know, Microsoft comes out with ChatGPT. Uh, they do an amazing demonstration. People are like this most incredible product. And Google working on AI even earlier, obviously the Microsoft, Microsoft was behind an AI. That was really their ChatGPT deal that gave them a market presence. And then Google does this fairly disastrous demonstration of BART. And the world says, oh my God, Google's fallen behind an AI. AI is the future. Stock gets crushed. Google gets to a price around 15 times earnings, which for a business of this quality is an extremely, extremely low price. And our view on Google, one way to think about it, when a business becomes a verb, mm -hmm. that's usually a pretty good sign about the mode around the business. You know, you'd open your computer and you open your search and very high percentage of the world starts with a Google page in one line where you type in your search. Google advertising search YouTube franchise is one of the most dominant franchises in the world. Very difficult to disrupt, extremely profitable. The world is moving from offline advertising to online advertising. And that trend, I think, continues. Why? Because you can actually see whether your ads work. You know, they used to say about advertising, you know, you spend a fortune and you just don't know which 50% of it works, but you just sort of spend the money because you know, ultimately that's going to bring in the customer. And now with online advertising, you can see with granularity which dollars I'm spending. When people click on the search term and end up buying something, it's a very high return on investment for the advertiser and they really dominate that business. Now, AI, of course, is a risk. If all of a sudden people start searching or asking questions of ChatGPT and don't start with the Google search bar, that's a risk to the company. And so our view, based on work we had done and talked to industry experts, is that Google, by virtue of the investment they've made, the time, the energy that people put into it, we felt their AI capabilities were, if anything, potentially greater than Microsoft ChatGPT and that the market had overreacted. And because Google is a big company, global business, regulators scrutinize it incredibly carefully. They couldn't take some of the same liberties. A startup like OpenAI did in releasing a product. And I think Google took a more cautious approach in releasing an early version of Bard in terms of its capabilities. And that let the world to believe that uh, they were behind. And we ultimately concluded they're tied or ahead and you're paying nothing for that potential business. And they also have huge advantages. Think of all the data Google has, like the search data and all the various applications, email and otherwise. 
it's an incredible data set. So they have more training data than pretty much any company in the world. They have incredible engineers. They have enormous financial resources. So that was kind of the bet. And we still think it's probably the cheapest of the big seven companies in terms of the price you're paying for the business relative to its current earnings. It also is a business that has a lot of potential for efficiency. You know, sometimes when you have this enormously profitable dominant company, all of the technology companies in the post-March 20 world grew enormously in terms of their teams and they probably overhired. And so you've seen some, you know, the Facebooks of the world and now even Google starting to get a little more efficient in terms of their operations. So low multiple for their business. One way to think about the value of the business is the price you pay for the earnings or alternatively, what's the yield? If you flip over the price over the earnings, it gives you kind of the yield of the business. So a 15 multiple is almost a seven and a half percent yield. And that earnings yield is growing over time as the business grows compared to what you can earn lending your money to the government, you know, 4%, that's a very attractive going in yield. And then there's all kinds of what we call optionality in all the various businesses and investments they've made that are losing money. We've got a cloud business that's growing very rapidly, but they're investing basically 100% of the profits from that business and growth. So you're in that earnings number, you're not seeing any earnings from the cloud business. And, you know, they're one of the top cloud players. So very interesting, generally well-managed company with incredible assets and resources and dominance has no debt, it's got a ton of cash. Pretty good story. Is there some more risk introduced by the possibilities of AI? Absolutely, that's a great question. Investing is about finding companies that can't be disrupted. AI is the ultimate disruptable asset or technology. And that's what makes investing treacherous, is that you own a business that's enormously profitable, management gets, if you will, fat and happy, and then a new technology emerges that just takes away all their profitability. And AI is this incredibly powerful tool, which is why every business is saying, how can I use AI in my business to make us more profitable, more successful, grow faster, and also disrupt or protect ourselves from the, you know, the incomings. It's a bit like, you know, Buffett talks about a great business, like a castle surrounded by this really wide moat, but you have all these barbarians trying to get in and uh, steal the uh, princess. And uh, it happens, you know, Kodak, for example, was an amazing, incredibly dominant company until it disappeared. Polaroid, you know, this incredible technology. And that's why we have tended to stay away from companies that are technology companies, because technology companies, generally, the world is such a dynamic place that someone's always working on a better version. And, you know, Kodak was caught up in the analog film world, and then the world changed. You mentioned management. How do you analyze the governance structure and the individual humans that are the managers of a company? As I like to say, incentives drive all human behavior. And that certainly applies in the business world. So understanding the people and what drives them and what the actual financial and other incentives of a business are very important part of the analysis for investing in a company. One great way to learn about a business is go back a decade and read everything that management has written about the business and see what they've done over time. You know, conference calls are relatively recent. When I started in the business, there weren't conference call transcripts. Now you have a written record of everything management has said in response to questions from analysts at conferences and otherwise. You learn a lot about people by listening to what they say, how they answer questions, and ultimately their track record for doing what they say they're going to do. Do they underpromise and overdeliver? Do they overpromise and underdeliver? Do they say what they're going to do? Do they admit mistakes? Do they build great teams? Do people want to come work for them? Are they able to retain their talent? And then part of it is how much are they running the business for the benefit of the business? How much are they running the business for the benefit of themselves? Very senior management matters enormously. You know, we use the Chipotle example. Steve Ells, great entrepreneur, business got to a scale. He really couldn't run it. The company recruited a guy named Brian Nickel, and he was considered the best person in the quick service industry. He came in and completely rebuilt the company. Actually, we moved the company. Chipotle was moved to California. And sometimes one way to redo the culture of a company is just to move it geographically. And then you can kind of reboot the business. But a great leader has great followership. Over the course of their career, they'll have a team they've built that will come follow them into the next opportunity. But the key is, you know, really the top person matters enormously. And then it's who they recruit. You know, you recruit an A-plus leader and they're going to recruit other A-type people. If you recruit a B leader, you're not going to recruit any great talent beneath them. You mentioned Warren Buffett. You said you admire him as an investor. What do you find most interesting and powerful about his approach? Most of what I've learned in the investment business, I've learned from Warren Buffett. He's been my great professor of this business. My first book I read in the business was The Ben Graham Intelligent Investor. But fairly quickly, you get to learn about Warren Buffett. And I started by reading the Berkshire Hathaway and reports. And then I eventually got the Buffett partnership letters that you could see, which are an amazing read to go back to the mid 1950s and read what he wrote to his limited partners when he first started out and just follow that trajectory over a long period of time. So what's remarkable about him is one duration, right? He's still at it at 93. Two, takes a very long-term view. But a big thing that you learn from him, investing requires this incredible, dispassionate, unemotional quality. You have to be extremely economically rational 
which is not something you learn in the jungle. If you think about the surviving the jungle, the lion shows up and everyone starts running, you run with them. That does not work well in markets. In fact, you generally have to do the opposite, right? When the lemmings are running over the cliff, that's the time where you're facing the other direction and you're running the other direction, i.e. you're stepping in, you're buying stocks at really low prices. You know, Buffett's been great at that and great at teaching about what he calls temperament, which is this sort of emotional kind of or unemotional quality that you need to be able to dispassionately look at the world and say, okay, is this a real risk? Are people overreacting? People tend to get excited about investments when stocks are going up and they get depressed when they're going down. I think that's just inherently human. You have to reverse that. You have to get excited when things get cheaper and you got to get concerned when things get more expensive. I think it's something you kind of learn over time. A key success factor is you want to have enough money in the bank that you're going to survive, you know, regardless of what's going on with volatility in markets. People who, one, you shouldn't borrow money. So if you borrow money, you own stocks on margin, markets are going down and you have your livelihood at risk. It's very difficult to be rational. So key is getting yourself to a place where you're financially secure. You're not going to lose your house, right? That's a, kind of a key thing. And then also doing your homework. Stocks can trade at any price in the short term. And if you know what a business is worth and you understand the management, you know it extremely well, it doesn't bother you when a stock price goes down or it has much less impact on you because you know, as uh, Mr. Graham said, you know, in the short term, the market's a voting machine. You have a bunch of lemmings voting one direction. That's concerning. But if it's a great business, doesn't have a lot of debt and people are going to just listen to more music next year than this year, you know you're going to do well. So it's a bit, some combination of being personally secure and also just knowing what you own. And over time, you build uh, calluses, I would say. I'm a pretty emotional person or I feel pretty strong emotions, but not in investing. I'm remarkably immune to kind of volatility. And that's a big advantage. And it took some time for me to develop that. So you weren't born with that, you think? No. So being emotional, do you want to respond to volatility? Yeah. You can learn a lot from other people's experience. It's one of the, the few businesses where you can learn an enormous amount by reading about other periods in history, following Buffett's career, the mistakes he made. If you're investing a lot of capital, every one of your mistakes can be big. Right? So we've made big mistakes. The good news is that the vast majority of things we've done have worked out really well. That also gives you confidence over time. But because we make very few investments, you know, we own eight things today or seven companies that matter. If we get one wrong, it's going to be big news. And so the other nature of our business you have to be comfortable with is a lot of public scrutiny, a lot of public criticism, and that requires some experience. <laughs> Call it that. The only person who can cause you more harm than a thief with a dagger is a journalist with a pen. Is there some general advice from the things you've been talking about that applies to everyday investors? Sure. Never invest money you can't afford to lose, where if you lost this money, and you know, you lose your house, et cetera. So being in a place where you're investing money that you don't care about the price in the short term, you know, it's money for your retirement and you take a really long-term view. I think that's key. Never investing where you borrow money against your securities. The markets offer you the opportunity to leverage your investment. And in most worlds, you'll be okay except if there's a financial crisis or you know a nuclear device gets detonated god forbid somewhere in the world or there's a unexpected war or you know someone kills a leader unexpectedly you know things happen that can change the course of history and markets react very negatively to those kinds of events and you can own the greatest business in the world trading for hundred dollars a share and next moment it could be 50. as long as you don't borrow against securities you own really high quality businesses and it's not money that you need in the short term, then you can actually be thoughtful about it. And that is a huge advantage. The vast majority of investors, it seems, tend to be the ones that panic in the downturns, get over elated when markets are doing well. Buffett is the ultimate long-term thinker. And just the decisions he makes, the consistency of the decisions he's made over time and fitting into that sort of long-term framework is a very educational, let's put it that way, for learning about this business. You mentioned eight companies, but what do you think about mutual funds for everyday investors that diversify across a larger number of companies? I think there are very few mutual funds. There are thousands and thousands of mutual funds. There are very few that earn their keep in terms of the fees they charge. They tend to be too diversified and too short-term, and you're often much better off just buying an index fund. If you look carefully at their portfolios, they're not so different from the underlying index itself, and you tend to pay a much higher fee. Now, all of that being said, there's some very talented mutual fund uh, managers. Will Danoff at Fidelity's had a great record over a long period of time. You know, the famous Peter Lynch, Ron Barron, another great long-term growth stock investor. So there's some great mutual funds, but I put them in the handful versus the thousands. And if you're in the thousands, I'd rather uh, someone bought just an index fund, basically. What would be the leap for an everyday investor to go to investing in a small number of companies, like two, three, four, five companies? 
I even recommend for individual investors to invest in, you know, a dozen companies. You don't get that much more benefit of diversification going from a dozen to 25 or even 50. You know, most of the benefits of diversification come in the first, call it 10 or 12. And if you're investing in businesses that don't have a lot of debt, they're businesses that you can understand yourself. You understand, actually, individual investors did a much better job analyzing Tesla than the so-called professional investors or analysts, the vast majority of them. So if it's a business you understand, if you bought a Tesla, you understand the product and its appeal to consumers. You know, it's a good place to start when you're analyzing a company. So I would invest in things you can understand. That's kind of a key. You like Chipotle, you understand why they're successful. You can you know, go there every week and you can monitor, is anything changing? How are these new, uh, how's chicken El Pastor? Is that a good upgrade from <laughs> the basic chicken? You know, uh, the drink offerings improving, uh, the store is clean. I think you should invest in companies you really understand. Simple businesses where you can predict with a high degree of confidence what it's gonna look like over time. And if you do that in a not particularly concentrated fashion and you don't borrow money against your securities, you'll probably do much better than your typical mutual fund. Yeah, it's interesting. Consumers that love a thing are actually good analysts of that thing, or I guess a good starting point. And by the way, there's much more information available today. When I was first investing, literally we had people faxing us documents from the SEC filings in Washington, DC. Now everything's available online. Conference call transcripts are free. AI, you know, you have unlimited data, all kinds of message boards and Reddit forums and things where people are, you know, sharing advice. And everyone has their own, by virtue of their career or experience, they'll know about an industry or a business. I would take advantage of your own competitive advantages.